Welcome everyone and good evening um, to this Evenings with Genetics uh, webinar on non-invasive prenatal testing. We're really thrilled to be able to have this topic tonight. I'm Susan Fernbach. I'm the director of the Evenings with Genetics seminar series, which is sponsored by the Department of Molecular and Human Genetics at Baylor College of Medicine and Texas Children's Hospital in Houston, Texas. Um, we are recording this webinar tonight, so we're going to save the questions to the end. Um, and I realize that for some of you, if you're in Europe, this is uh, the middle of the night for you, so we do fully appreciate that. Um, but that's, that's how we have planned this and it, it works um, the best. So please mute your laptops or your phones and um, we will have time for the questions. You can type them into the chat or you can raise your hand or unmute. Um, but our speakers tonight, we have um, Ms. Vina Mathur, who's a genetic counselor and instructor in the Department of Molecular and Human Genetics. Um, and she received her bachelor's degree in biology from the University of Houston, and then her master's degree in genetic counseling from Virginia Commonwealth University Medical College of Virginia in Richmond. And Ms. Mathur is a certified genetic counselor and sees families for prenatal and preconception genetic counseling. And for the question and answer um, session, she'll be joined by two additional faculty members, Dr. April Adams, an assistant professor of obstetrics and gynecology, as well as molecular and human genetics at Baylor College of Medicine, and Sandra Darlek, an assistant professor of molecular and human genetics um, and co-manager of the prenatal genetic service at Baylor. So please give a warm welcome for Vina and uh, I will let her take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to confirm once again that everyone can still hear me and nothing magical has happened to my sound. Okay, I see Susan nodding. Thank you. So uh, welcome to this evening with genetics seminar. And for those of you watching after the fact, this is being recorded on Tuesday, November 24th, 2020. Um, tonight, we will be discussing non-invasive prenatal testing for both chromosomal and single gene disorders. And let's see if I can advance my slides. There we go. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to briefly mention that Sam and I are all employees of Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, Baylor is partnered with Baylor Genetics, which is a commercial laboratory that performs NIPT for single gene disorders. Um, that said, none of us receive financial compensation or income from Baylor Genetics. So today's objectives are to discuss um, some of the following. We want to make sure that our audience has a, a basic understanding of the genetic concepts behind NIPT and understand some of the uses for this type of genetic screening during pregnancy. Um, and then some of those basics will include the specific conditions that NIPT is able to screen for. That will include aneuploidies, which I'll define as we go along here, um, some conditions that involve deletions and duplications of chromosome material, single gene disorders, um, and we'll also get into the limitations of NIPT, the uncertainties around NIPT, and importantly, the future directions and where we see this going beyond 2020. And as Susan mentioned in the beginning, um, if you would like to ask a question, the best way to do that is to enter it into the chat field. And as we're going along, both Sandra and Dr. Adams will be looking at those questions. And at the end, we'll make sure that we address them for the audience. Um, and in addition, if you think of a question at the end of this seminar, please feel free to enter that into the chat and we can answer it verbally. So as we get started, I wanted to just poll the audience to figure out um, where people are coming from in terms of their background knowledge. So to do that, um, if you are using a laptop and it's easy, you can feel free to go to this URL that I've posted here, or if it's easier on your cell phone, 
Um, if you can send a text message to the number 22333, and in the body of that text message, you can simply put this word Vena Mother 431. This will allow you to join the poll, and then from there, you'll be able to select your answer. So I'll give everybody maybe 20, 30 seconds to get that going. And hopefully these polls are familiar. If you are unable to join the poll, that is okay. This is just an informal way um, to help me know what you already know coming into this talk. And also I should mention that these polls are anonymous as well. So feel free to answer honestly. So with that said, the question I'm asking is, Again, what do you know about NIPT coming into today's talk? So option A is for those that are very familiar with NIPT but interested to learn more about recent advances and future directions. Um, option B is for those who have heard some about it before but don't know a ton and are here to learn more. Uh, option C is I know basically nothing. This is all news to me. And then option D is I'm here because somebody told me I needed to be here, but I am willing to listen politely. So you can enter your answer. Next, we'll see if this works. Okay. So it looks like we've got a good mix of folks, many of whom are either don't know much of anything about NIPT, some people who've heard about it and others that are very familiar with it. So um, I will let you know up front that this talk is primarily geared for people who fall into categories B or C, um, but I will sprinkle in some technical details that hopefully will appeal to those that fall into a group A. All right, thank you very much. All right, first a little bit of introductory genetics. For some of us, um, high school biology was a long time ago. So I think this will be useful in helping to understand what NIPT is and how that can be useful. So if you look at a cell under the microscope, you can see that within that cell, we all have chromosomes. And chromosomes are the packages that contain our individual genes. So when you unwind this chromosome, our genes are the specific instructions that tell our body how to grow and develop. So focusing on these chromosomes for a moment, if you organize the chromosomes within a single cell, you'll see that most of us have 46. And chromosomes come in pairs. And Susan, are you able to see my pointer? Yes. yes, I can see it. Mm -hmm. Perfect, thank you. So the first 22 pairs are the same between males and females, and the last pair will affect the sex of that person. Girls typically have two copies of the X chromosome, and boys have one X and one Y. Within each of these pairs, one chromosome comes from our mother, and the other comes from our father. So. 46 chromosomes is sort of the, the recipe that makes us who we are. And for many years, we've been offering some form of screening for at least a few of these chromosome conditions. And historically, these screens have been performed on a sample of mom's blood. And the goal is to see what's the chance for a baby to have a specific chromosome condition. Is that chance increased or decreased? So women that this screening might be useful for are the ones who are unsure if they want diagnostic testing. And very briefly, diagnostic testing involves going in and getting a sample from the placenta, from the amniotic fluid, looking at cells directly, and then giving a yes or no answer about chromosome conditions. But because those are more invasive procedures and not everyone knows that they want those, screening can be a useful step. And then there are certainly those women who know from the beginning of pregnancy that they're not interested in diagnostic testing, but still want some information about potential risk for the pregnancy. Um, now, on the other hand, there are those women who think that, well, if I do any form of screening, whether the results are normal or abnormal, it may just make me more anxious than I was to 
begin with, then they might decide not to do any form of screening. And then other women will say, well, even if my baby has some chromosome change, it's not going to change anything about how I prepare for the birth or any decisions that I make. So they might decline the screening. So to start out with, I just wanted to kind of briefly talk about the common chromosome conditions that we typically look for with NIPT. And then I'll get into what NIPT really is. This term that we use, aneuploides, means conditions that are caused by having an extra or missing copy of a chromosome or extra missing chromosome material. And one thing to know is that these conditions mostly just happen by chance. It's not because of anything the parents did or anything the baby was exposed to. Typically, no one in the family has ever had a chromosome condition before because these usually are not hereditary. And we often see a chromosome condition in a baby when no one in the family has ever been affected with such a condition. Um, and so that means that even if you have a family where nobody has had this before, it doesn't actually decrease the risk for that particular pregnancy. The only factor that we do know that can affect the risk is the age of the mother, the age of the woman that's pregnant. So I'll give you some examples of that in a moment. So of the different chromosome conditions that are out there, Down syndrome is the most common one and one that I think many in our audience will have heard of before. Babies that have Down syndrome have an extra copy of chromosome number 21. So it's also known as trisomy 21. And babies and children and adults with Down syndrome have some physical features that are distinct. You can often tell by the shape of their eyes. They may be shorter than others their ears are lower set, and people with Down syndrome have some level of intellectual disability. It's typical, typically more mild or moderate, as well as an increased chance for things like heart defects or blockages in their intestines. And even for those children with Down syndrome that are born pretty healthy, they do get special medical care throughout their life. Other chromosome conditions that we know of are rare compared to Down syndrome, but more severe. So a couple of other examples are things like trisomy 18. And those babies have an extra copy of chromosome number 18. There's also trisomy 13 with an extra 13. So many people will never have heard of these conditions before. And that's because these babies typically have birth defects in multiple organs, like their brain, heart, kidneys. And often these babies either don't make it through the pregnancy or don't live very long after birth, although there are some exceptions to that. On the milder end, other chromosome conditions involve having extra or missing sex chromosomes. So one such example is called Klinefelter syndrome. And this one affects boys because they still have that Y chromosome, but there's an extra copy of the X. And we say that this is generally milder because these boys typically don't have severe intellectual disabilities or major birth defects. They may have some learning difficulty compared to their siblings, but when they're born, they look male, they've got male genitalia, it doesn't affect their sexual orientation. But we notice when these boys enter puberty, they do tend to be taller than other kids and the shape of their body may be different. As adults, they typically have infertility. So there are boys or men with Klinefelter syndrome who don't always get diagnosed right away because it doesn't stand out the way that other chromosome conditions do. So as I mentioned before, the chance for these chromosome conditions is related to the age of the mother. With each year of her life, the chance for her baby to have an extra or missing chromosome goes up somewhat. So this slide shows what's the chance for these specific conditions based on the mother's age. So to keep it simple, we use an example of a woman who is 35 years old. And if we do testing in the middle of her pregnancy, the chance for her baby to have some extra or missing chromosome is one out of 141. So that's less than a 1% chance. And the chance for her baby to have Down syndrome in particular is something like one out of 310. So the odds are still in her favor that the baby would not have a chromosome condition, 
but you can also see how with each year of her life, that chance goes up somewhat more. So next I'd like to talk more specifically about what is NIPT? What is this non-invasive prenatal testing? And a word about the, the terminology that we use, this testing has a lot of different terms depending on who you talk to or what literature you read. It could be called non-invasive prenatal testing or screening or cell-free DNA. For the purposes of this talk, I will simply call it NIPT or non-invasive prenatal testing. But if you see other terminology, it's all the same thing. So this testing involves getting a blood sample from a woman that's pregnant, as long as she is at least nine or 10 weeks into that pregnancy. And when we look at her blood, we know that there are fragments of DNA that are just floating around. And something like 90% of that DNA is coming from the mother herself, from her own cells. And roughly 10% of the DNA that we find is coming from the pregnancy and specifically coming from the placenta. So it's these fragments that we are interested in testing. Um, one thing to know is that when NIPT first was becoming clinically available at the end of 2011, we were just screening specifically for Down syndrome. And then in 2012, um, labs had done more studies to validate their testing to also screen for trisomy 18 and trisomy 13, some of those rare but more severe conditions. Um, and then soon after that, they were also able to look to see, is there any evidence of Y chromosome DNA in that woman's blood? Because the presumption is that if we find DNA from a Y chromosome, and women don't generally have a Y chromosome, then that baby is probably a chromosomally male. Whereas if you don't find Y chromosome DNA, that baby is probably chromosomally female. Um, and then in 2013, labs added the ability to screen for these sex chromosome conditions, meaning extra or missing copies of sex chromosomes. So this is a technical slide to talk about how the screening works, but essentially what the lab does in many cases is anytime they find a fragment of DNA, they don't always differentiate if this is maternal or placental in origin. It's just going to read it letter for letter and put it in what you can think of as a statistical bucket. So they have these buckets for chromosomes 21, 13, 18, and the sex chromosomes. And they know in a typical pregnancy how much DNA should be in each of these buckets. And then are looking to see in any particular bucket, is there too much or too little DNA from that particular chromosome? So in this example, if they find a little bit of extra DNA from chromosome 21, that result gets flagged and they say this pregnancy is at increased risk for trisomy 21, which again is Down syndrome. Other NIPT labs do their testing in a different way. Uh, very briefly, they rely on what we call SNPs. And SNPs are essentially just minor changes that we all have in our DNA that don't affect the function of the gene, but we know that even for people who are unrelated to one another, they might share a few SNPs in common, but when you start looking at multiple regions, multiple SNPs, you can start to tell the difference between different people or people who are related by blood. So labs will use these SNPs to determine What's the SNP profile like for a baby that usually has normal chromosomes versus what is the SNP profile like for babies that have chromosome conditions? And this is also useful because they can then differentiate in a fragment of DNA, is this more likely coming from the mother herself or is it coming from the pregnancy? So, what are some of the benefits of doing NIPT for these common chromosome conditions, these common aneuploidies? We know, again, that the chance for an aneuploidy in a pregnancy is related to the mom's age. And one of the nice things about NIPT is that if you compare it to older screening methods, it does have a higher detection rate and a lower false positive rate, which is not to say that it's a diagnostic test. We will get into that as well. Um, in addition, older screening methods were not able to screen 
for extra or missing sex chromosomes in a baby, whereas NIPT is able to, to, to do that. Um, some additional benefits of NIPT is that, again, compared to some of the older screening methods that we had 10 years ago, normal results are even more reassuring. It doesn't mean that there's a zero risk, but a significantly reduced risk. And on the other hand, if the results come back positive, if they show an increased risk for one of these chromosome conditions that's associated with a higher risk, than it would have been if you had positive screening 10 years ago. So to illustrate this point, we know that if a woman is 35 years old and the results come back positive for Down syndrome, that means that the chance for the baby to truly have Down syndrome is on the order of about 80%. Whereas if she had a positive quad screen for Down syndrome, which is an older screening method, the actual chance for an affected baby could be as low as one out of 200. So in other words, 0.5% chance. So NIPT can do a better job of separating those pregnancies that are at increased versus decreased risk. So one question that we get all the time, one question that you may be asking yourself is how accurate is NIPT for these common aneuploidies? Unfortunately, there's not a simple answer to that, and it depends on what you mean when you say accurate. So it's always easier to think of this in concrete terms. So let's pretend that you are a 35-year-old woman. I know that for some people that would be a miracle, but let's say you're 35, you're currently pregnant, and maybe about three months into that pregnancy, about 12 weeks. So some questions you might have are, in general, if we're testing a bunch of pregnant women, how likely is NIPT to detect Down syndrome if a baby really has Down syndrome? So in other words, what you're asking about, what's the sensitivity of the test? What's the detection rate? On the other hand, you might be asking, oh, I'm sorry. In this situation, um, just across the board, NIPT will come back with a positive result for babies that have Down syndrome a little over 99% of the time. So it is a very sensitive test. Um, another question is just, if we're testing women of all ages and all different categories, how likely are you to get a low risk NIPT result for a baby that does not have Down syndrome? In that case, what you're asking about is the specificity and that's related to the chance for getting a false positive result. So going back to this example for Down syndrome in general, they say that the specificity again is very high, well over 99%, and the chance for getting a false positive is also very low, 0.09%. But one thing to keep in mind about these numbers that I'm giving you here is that it doesn't actually tell you anything about your specific risk estimates. These are estimates for across you know, large numbers of women who are being tested with all kinds of different risk numbers. So most people, when they're asking about accuracy, want to know, how does this apply to me, to my pregnancy? So to that end, many people would want to know, if my NIPT comes back showing an increased risk for Down syndrome, what's the chance for my baby to truly be affected? So in statistics, they call this the positive predictive value of the test. So again, going back to that 35-year-old woman who's pregnant and doing the test, the chance for her baby to be affected is about 80%, which is a very different number from the sensitivity and specificity that I showed you earlier. The other question people ask is, if I get a normal result, if it's low risk for Down syndrome, what's the chance that my baby is not affected? and that term is called the negative predictive value. And again, that is a very high number, 99.997% chance. It's not 100%, but that's why a normal NIPT can be very reassuring. So these numbers, the way that we calculate these numbers depend on a few different ideas. What's the detection rate? What's the false positive rate? But importantly, what's the risk that you had going into the test. And that's not the same for every woman. So with that, time for another poll. And again, you will either text to that 22333 number 
And if you've already registered, then you are ready to go. So the question is, which of the following women has a higher chance for an effective baby? And this is mostly just based on your own intuition. So example A is a woman that's 40 years old and she gets a positive NIPT result for Down syndrome. Um, option number two or B is a 25 year old woman who has a positive result for trisomy 13, which is a rarer condition. Um, you might think that either these women have the same chance to be affected or if you have no idea, that is okay. Let me know that too. I just wanna get a sense of what our audience thinks. So I'll give you a minute to think through this and enter your answer. Okay, I'll go to the next slide. And if seeing other people's answer influences your own, that's okay. We're not getting graded on this. So let me, okay, looks like so far we know that, that most people saying that there's a, the 40 year old has a higher chance for an effective baby. See if any additional responses come in. Got at least one or two folks who think that their chance is the same. So say the 25-year-old has a higher risk. A couple more moments to think through this answer. All right. So the answer to this question is A. The woman who is 40 years old and has a positive result for Down syndrome have a higher chance that her baby is truly affected. And the reason for that is we know that number one, Down syndrome is simply a more common condition than trisomy 13. And number two, when you're 40 years old, the chance for your baby to have any kind of chromosome condition is higher than it is at 25. So in other words, the 40 year old's risk for having a baby with Down syndrome is higher to start with. And so that's why the positive predictive value is higher for her than it would be for a woman who has a positive result for trisomy 13. All right, so we've talked about some of the benefits of NIPT, but there are certainly limitations for this as well. So as I've been saying, it's not a diagnostic test. If you get a positive result, it does not mean the baby is necessarily affected. But if you get a negative result, it's not an all clear. Um, it is not screening in general for every chromosome abnormality. There are always limitations. And we'll talk about some exceptions and some other chromosome conditions that we can screen for. Another thing to think about is that these DNA fragments, the cell-free DNA that the lab is looking at is coming from the placenta. It's not coming directly from the baby. And most of the time, the DNA from the placenta is the same as the baby's DNA, but there are exceptions to that rule. And that can be an important thing to consider and a potential source of false positive results or false negatives for that matter. Um, there are other causes or other limitations that we need to think about. Sometimes a woman will do testing and the lab can provide no results at all. Um, we may see atypical results where they find something, but it's not one of the usual chromosome conditions they intend to screen for. Um, and in other cases, an otherwise healthy woman can have changes in her own chromosomes that can throw off these test results. So this isn't really intended to be an in-depth discussion of all these limitations. You probably get more details if you're doing a genetic counseling appointment, but this is to give you some sense of the fact that it's truly not diagnostic and sometimes you get results that we weren't anticipating. So next I wanna talk a little bit about how NIPT can be performed for what we call microdeletion syndromes. So we've been focusing on conditions that are caused by extra or missing copies of chromosomes, but we know that some babies will have the correct number of chromosomes, but there may be a piece of material that is either extra or missing. So if there is a small amount of missing material, the term for that is a micro deletion. If there's a small amount of extra material, that's called a micro duplication. 
So if you're thinking of chromosomes as the books in our genetic library, we can have extra missing volumes or even extra missing pages of information. So there are a handful of conditions that are caused by these micro deletions that NIPT might be able to detect. Um, screening for these micro deletions isn't something that's done on all NIPT samples. Um, in some situations, it can be helpful, and I'll go into that in just a moment here. And certainly in situations where a woman comes back with an increased risk result for a micro deletion, it's definitely a good idea to, for her to meet with a genetic counselor to talk about what does this really mean. So some of the limitations of NIPT for micro deletions specifically is that Number one, not all labs will screen for micro deletions. So it really depends on what lab is performing the testing in the first place. And also we need to consider the fact that there are over 150 syndromes that are caused by micro deletions and micro duplications. And the majority of those are not gonna be picked up on NIPT. Um, it also will not work if the mother herself has one of these conditions. So for example, if a woman has a condition called DeGeorge syndrome, which is a micro deletion on chromosome 22, so much of the cell-free DNA that we find in her sample will have that small deletion and it becomes really hard to discern, does the baby have that deletion as well or not? Because we're talking about really tiny amounts of DNA. Um, in addition, if the NIPT comes back positive for such a condition, it doesn't necessarily mean that the baby is affected or even likely to be affected. The chance to, for, or that positive predictive value that I was talking about may be really difficult to calculate, may not even be able to calculate that at all. And then again, if it's normal, it doesn't rule out these conditions with 100% certainty. Some of these micro deletions may be not the typical deletion that most people have and make it harder for the NIPT lab to call that correctly. There are also some labs out there that will use NIPT to screen for some of the rarer aneuploidies. So for example, if a baby has an extra copy of chromosome 16 or chromosome 22. Um, now, one thing that we know is that having those rare chromosome conditions we is especially rare the further along that woman gets. So once she gets to about 10 weeks in the pregnancy, it's unlikely that her baby would have such a condition because often those pregnancies don't make it to 10 weeks. Um, we also know that some babies may have a very large deletion or duplication of material, in which case it's not even micro. But some of those limitations that I mentioned before still apply. The issues of what's the PPV, what's the chance that the baby truly has this condition may not always be easy to tell with some of those chromosome conditions. Um, the next part of this discussion that I'll go through fairly quickly is talking about how we can do NIPT for what we call single gene disorders. So going back to the basic genetics here, if you unwind the chromosomes, you can get to the level of individual genes. We all have about 20,000 genes that are wrapped up within these chromosomes. And there are a few thousand genetic conditions that are caused not by extra missing chromosomes, but changes within individual genes. So going back to that analogy, it's typos within the sentences of our genetic library. So what single gene NIPT is meant to do is screen that fragmented placental DNA in mom's blood and focus on one or several individual genes to see if they have any changes, any mutations that are known to cause genetic diseases. So some people, instead of calling the single gene NIPT, will call it multi-gene NIPT because it's looking at several different genes at once. So the intent is that it gives us some information about the chance for the baby to have a new non-inherited genetic condition. I'll give you a couple examples in just a moment here. And because it's looking for a completely different type of condition, not chromosome conditions, 
it doesn't replace the NIPT that I was discussing before. Sometimes it is a complement. The first versions of this, this single gene NIPT that was available was looking at 25 specific genes and to see if there are mutations that could cause one of 30 different genetic disorders that are out there. So many people then wonder, okay, well, when would you talk about single gene NIPT and what are the circumstances where it might be ordered? Um, there are some people, of course, who, when they're pregnant, and this single gene NIPT can be done in those situations. In general, if a woman is pregnant and she says, I want this kind of testing, the chance that we get something significant in the results is maybe one woman out of 600. Another condition or another situation where this might be discussed is what we call advanced paternal age. So we usually define advanced maternal age as a pregnant woman who's at or over the age of 35. And the reason this is important for males is not so much because it changes the chance for extra or missing chromosomes, but it could affect the chance for these new mutations. So we know that when men, as they age, they're still making new sperm cells every few days. And it could happen that one particular sperm ends up with a random mutation that perhaps none or very few of the other sperm cells have, that the father himself is not really a carrier for. But if that's the sperm that finds the egg, then you might see a new genetic condition in that pregnancy. And we do have data to show that with each year of the father's life, the chance for these new mutations in sperm does go up. So some other uses for single gene NIPT would be if the father himself has one of these 30 specific genetic conditions that are covered on the panel. So this is particularly relevant if the father has a known mutation. If he's already had genetic testing and we know what gene and what mutation to look for. So without that information, testing on the pregnancy may not be fully informative. If you get a normal result, it's not always clear. Is it because the baby's truly unaffected or did, just, did we just not know what we were looking for? Um, or if an ultrasound, particularly later in the pregnancy, shows findings that make you think about one of these 30 specific genetic conditions, but the mother's not interested in doing an invasive procedure that would give us more diagnostic information. So one example is if we see later in the pregnancy that the length of the long bones like in the upper arm or upper legs are much shorter or other ultrasound findings, we might be suspicious of a condition called achondroplasia. And achondroplasia is caused by changes in a gene called FGFR3. You've never heard of achondroplasia before, um, but if you've ever seen Game of Thrones, the actor Peter Dinklage has achondroplasia. So, and just with anything, single gene NIPT also has its limitations. It's not diagnostic. I hope you're sensing a theme here. Um, there have not been any published cases of false positive results, but we need a lot more information about how this works clinically before we can give good information about the, that positive predictive value. As of right now, if we get a positive result for, let's say, achondroplasia, especially if there aren't ultrasound findings, it's very hard for doctors or genetic counselors to tell that woman, what's the chance that my baby truly has achondroplasia? And so that's why we recommend some form of diagnostic testing either during or after pregnancy. Um, another limitation is cost. This testing is not considered the standard of care and so not all insurance companies will cover this testing. Um, again, there's not a formal definition of what constitutes advanced paternal age, and that can affect the, whether it's covered by insurance or not. Um, and it doesn't work in specific situations. Like if the mother has one of these 30 conditions, if it's a twin pregnancy, and it also requires having a blood sample, not just from mom, but from dad too. So if he's unavailable, then this testing just won't work. So... I think I'll kind of briefly skip over how this single gene NIPT work, but suffice it to say that it is relying on those SNPs that I was 
discussing before and sequencing the 25 genes of interest, reading them letter for letter to see if we find any genetic changes that we know are associated with genetic conditions. Um, briefly, I wanted to talk about some other applications of single gene NIPT. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. There is one particular company that is offering single gene NIPT in the context of carrier screening. We know that in every genetic or every ethnic group, there are some genetic conditions that are more common than others. So for many of these conditions like sickle cell disease or cystic fibrosis, the baby would only be at risk if both partners are carriers of the same genetic disease. And then if they are, every time they get pregnant, there's a 25% chance for a baby to be affected. So one particular lab that's out there will perform carrier screening on mothers to see if she is a carrier for one of a few specific conditions, things like cystic fibrosis, sickle cell disease. And these numbers just illustrate that they are not super rare depending on that person's ethnic group. And then if that woman is found to be a carrier for one of those conditions, rather than having to take the extra time to get the male partner tested, see if he's a carrier too, and then do testing, diagnostic testing of the pregnancy, this particular lab will perform single gene NIPT immediately when they see the woman as a carrier to see if they can determine whether the baby is at increased or decreased risk to have the genetic condition, not just to be a carrier, but to actually have the disease and the symptoms that go with it. Um, there are, there's at least one other lab in the U.S. that performs what I'll call custom single gene NIPT. So essentially what this is designed for are those pregnancies where we know off the bat that there is an increased risk for some other inherited condition that may or may not be all that rare. So for example, if the mother or the father has a genetic condition themselves and there's an increased risk for passing that on, um, if we already know that both partners are carriers for the same recessive disorder like sickle cell disease, or if they've had a previous child with a genetic condition and we know what the mutations are that that child has. Um, this is certainly not considered standard of care even in 2020. Um, this custom single gene NIPT has only been validated on a small number of pregnancies. Um, it's not available for all genetic disorders, it's, and some mutations are harder to detect than others. It's also a lengthy process. It can take between four to seven weeks for them, for the lab to perform this testing from start to finish. And in some cases, they'll review the information from, that the genetic counselor provides and say, we're not able to do some custom at single gene NIPT in this situation. It's also expensive as well, and labs don't bill insurance for that. Um, newer directions are focusing on what we call cell-based NIPT. So this is a totally different application. Uh, we know that when women are pregnant, cells from the placenta will wash off into mom's blood. And eventually those cells break apart and release that cell-free DNA, that fragmented DNA that most NIPT is using for testing. Um, but what researchers have been trying to do for quite a while is isolate those cells from the placenta. The technical name is trophoblast cells while they're still intact. Even if we find five or six or seven of these trophoblast cells, we might be able to do more complete chromosome analysis and dig in deeper to look for the micro deletions, micro duplications, or maybe even test individual genes and then get results that are more like a diagnostic test as opposed to a screening test. So again, we can visualize that these are the cells that are coming from the placenta and should have the same chromosomes and same DNA as the pregnancy with exceptions. And then you'll also find that cell-free DNA that's mixed in there. And with time, we've had advances with how to do the blood draw technique so that we don't destroy the trophoblast cells. Um, how do we amplify the DNA and the cells in the laboratory so that we can consistently deliver results. 
So this is exciting technology and there have been very great advances in the last several years. Um, now it's time for one last poll. So wake up, pay attention. <laughs> so this last question, again, if you've already got your cell phone, you'll text the either A, B, C, or D, or no, I'm, I apologize. Instead, this is a, a free text answer. So what I would like to know from you is of any genetic condition that you've heard of or something that you've seen in your family, what are you most interested in seeing NIPT be available for one day? So feel free to pretext those responses and we'll see what comes up. Cancer genetics. There's some interesting applications there. That's just me. <laughs> Sickle cell variants. Yeah, this is important. Uterine cancer. And one thing that I should mention is that many people, or much of the time when we're doing testing during pregnancy, the focus is what's the chance for that woman to have a baby with a genetic condition that affects baby either during pregnancy or sometime during childhood. So people are very concerned of naturally about cancer predispositions. But I think current NIP tech technologies are not really focused on that yet. Um, their congenital adrenal hyperplasia is a great one and the genetics of that are complicated. Many people who are affected will have several mutations within the same gene. I would love to see that so that we can get diagnoses earlier. Um, rare neurodevelopmental disorders are really important because individually, a genetic condition can be rare, but when you add them all together, they become not so rare. Autism, Syngap-1, very good answers. People, a couple more minutes to finish up these responses. Neurological diseases, there are many that have infantile or childhood onset that would be really helpful to know. Pompe disease is a good one. So, in a perfect world, we would be able to get a blood sample on a pregnant woman and test for a variety of these conditions without having to do an invasive procedure and have good confidence in these results. Um, one thing to consider just briefly is what are the recommendations from professional societies? Societies like the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, the American College of Medical Genetics, um, and these are comprised of the physicians that are involved in ordering this testing. And this is also, these recommendations are what doctors and genetic counselors pay attention to when they offer genetic testing. So according to quite a recent ACOG practice bulletin, um, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists was saying that all pregnant women regardless of their situation, should be offered both screening and diagnostic testing. So when they say screening, that could be some of the older methods of screening that have nothing to do with DNA, but just protein and hormone levels, ultrasound, or cell-free DNA, in other words, NIPT. And they also specifically say that screening for other conditions like microdeletion, some of the rare aneuploidies um, or larger deletions or duplications is not recommended because the accuracy isn't well established. We don't always know what's the false positive rate, what's the detection rate for the test because we're talking about relatively small numbers of affected pregnancies in general. Um, an ACMG statement in 2016 has said that essentially they feel that all pregnant women should understand that NIPT is available and that it is the most sensitive way of screening, at least for the common chromosome conditions, things like Down syndrome, trisomy 13, trisomy 18. And a couple other points to know is that ACOG, as of February of last year, put out what's called a practice advisory, so just a quick recommendation regarding NIPT for single gene disorders, and said at least at that time that there hasn't been sufficient data to 
determine the false positive rate and the accuracy of this testing. And so they were saying, at least at that time, that this testing is not recommended for pregnancy. One thing to know is that these recommendations are not rules that must be followed 100% of the time or else you're a bad doctor, a bad genetic counselor. There are certainly some clinical situations where this screening can make sense. But one reason I point out these society guidelines is that if nothing else, it also influences how likely are these versions of NIPT to be covered by insurance, which can sometimes affect whether the test becomes prohibitively expensive. So finally, just some things to think about as you walk away from this evening with genetics seminar tonight. As I've pointed out, there really is no version of NIPT that's diagnostic that's 100% accurate. It really is just determining increased risk versus decreased risk. And NIPT on paper can have a really good detection rate and a really low false positive rate, but not really tell you with a whole lot of certainty if the baby does in fact have that condition. And luckily in 2020, we are able to screen for some conditions that we really were not able to screen for non-invasively even six years ago. Some of these rare chromosome conditions, these small chromosome conditions, um, and mutations in individual genes. Um, but the majority of rare genetic conditions, many of the ones that you all were giving examples of are not yet screenable with our current technology, but advances are happening all the time. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention um, and bearing with me while I go through all of this. Um, I've put our contact information if you'd like to contact either me, Sandra, or Dr. Adams, who you'll be hearing from when we get to the Q&A portion. Um, and the, a final point that I'd like to point out is that if you are pregnant or if you one day become a doctor and you're offering this testing to somebody and you're not sure what version of NIT, NIPT makes the most sense, it's always a good idea to consult with a prenatal geneticist or a genetic counselor. So with that, um, I will turn it over to Sandra and Dr. Adams, and they will go through the chat to pull out some of the questions and provide some answers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bina. That was such a clear presentation. Thank you very much. And and now, yes, thank you to Dr. Adams and Sandra for joining us for the Q&A, and this is wonderful. And there were some questions there. Yes, it looks like we had a couple that came through, so I'll go ahead and read the first one that came through, and then I guess you and, and I, Dr. Adams, can fight over them as we go. <laughs> uh, the first question we got was, um, if the egg is from a younger woman but is growing in an older woman, is there less chance of aneuploidy in that case? And so I'm, I can take that one. And okay. I think that's a, it's a really good, it's a really good question. Yeah, it's a great question. Actually. Um, and especially, you know, I think with IVF and in vitro fertilization being more and more common and, and people, um, some women using donor eggs to get pregnant, um, it really depends on the, the age of the egg. So if that egg was removed from the woman's body, retrieved, as we say, from the ovaries when she was say 30, then that's the, that's the age that we pay attention to when we're calculating risks. So she could be, you know, 37 when that embryo that was conceived using that egg is becoming a pregnancy, but we would use that younger age in that, that category. So, um, so that, that is one of the benefits of things like donor eggs from an age-related perspective. Um, the second question we got, and this is a great one as well, is there any screening test, are there any screening tests for autism since it's at least in part a genetic condition? Dr. Adams, do you want to field that one? Yeah, sure. I think, yeah, that is a great question. Um, and so autism definitely has some genetic components. We really do consider it kind of a, a multifactorial condition. So there's not like, we're not looking say for instance, like Down syndrome for a specific change in the number of chromosomes. Um, and it's also not a condition that you can diagnose uh, 
um, during pregnancy. And so it really doesn't fit criteria for what we would look for as a screening test. And we're looking for things that we can make a help you make a definitive diagnosis during your pregnancy. Um, and we also know a lot about the characteristics of that specific condition and how to look for it with a diagnostic test like sampling the amniotic fluid or sampling the placenta. Um, you know, things like this, as um, Vina mentioned, lots of different types of screening and testing are on the horizon. But right now, that's really not something that we screen for prenatally. So the next question we got is, is PGD testing in embryos more accurate than NIPT? Um, do you want me to handle that one, Dr. Yeah, Adams? Or you... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, it's, that's a good question as well. I think, you know, for those of you who aren't aware, PGD is what we refer to as pre-implantation genetic diagnosis or testing. It's testing that's done on embryos and very frequently it's chromosome-based testing that's done on embryos. And I would kind of put it in this in a similar category to NIPT. It's a screen more so than a diagnostic test because similar to NIPT, what you're getting in that embryo testing are cells that will ultimately become the placenta during the pregnancy. And so again, while the placenta most of the time does match what the baby's DNA ultimately looks like, there are exceptions to that. So some of the similar issues you can have with NIPT can also sometimes apply to embryo testing. Also, because you're, it's a much smaller amount of DNA that you're working with when you're working with testing on embryos, sometimes the detail that you get about those chromosomes is a little bit less than what you can get from other types of um, prenatal testing, like your diagnostic tests, like um, amniocentesis or CVS. So while that PG certainly reduces risk, going in for chromosome conditions, it's very much like NIPT, a negative result doesn't eliminate those risks. Another question that we got is, how should a pediatrician approach a child with a prenatal diagnosis of Turner syndrome with NIPT, but no further testing being done? Um, so that's also, these are really great questions, actually. <laughs> um, so in any instance, when we look at NIPT, we always want to just emphasize that it is a screening test. It's a test that tells us, okay, should we be concerned and be looking further? But we always use a next step to make a definitive diagnosis. So if somebody decides they just want to have NIPT, they don't want to pursue any other testing during pregnancy, our recommendation is always to have postnatal follow-up with your pediatric geneticist um, and have postnatal testing or whatever is indicated based on the exam and findings that happen after delivery. So we would always recommend yeah, that follow-up diagnostic testing um, and not to just use that as the final diagnosis. Absolutely. So the next question we got was, can embryos be damaged resulting in de novo genetic conditions during the PGD process? Um, so again, I think that's a really good question. Um, when you're doing the, the embryo testing, you're biopsying the embryos. You're taking a small amount of, of cells from that, that embryo. Currently, there's no data that seems to provide evidence that the biopsy itself causes genetic mutations or causes even things like birth defects. So we don't have any evidence that you're increasing the risk for those types of things when you do that type of, of embryo testing. Um, we've been doing embryo testing for about 30 years now in one form or another. And so we do have some, you know, fairly good data, um, but again, it, it, it is an area where we continue to learn a lot, but right now we don't see any major concerns about that process itself causing those types of risks. Um, the next question we got is, can a woman of advanced age do anything to increase egg health? I'll let you take that one, Dr. Adams. <laughs> um, that's a good, good question as well. Um, so I think that really the, the big things is that we always talk about advanced maternal age. We kind of, you know, you saw the table of these are the increased risks of things that happen as age increases. Um, and really 
aneuploidy and all of the these conditions, the common things that we screen for, can't really be prevented. There are things that happen in the whole population, no matter if you're 25 or 45. It's just that the chance of it is, is increased um, with age. But it's really not something that you're doing in your diet or health-wise that changes the risk for a chromosome disorder. Um, I do always recommend that everybody optimize all of their health conditions before pregnancy, no matter what. Um, but those are not really things that will change your risk for changes in the number of chromosomes or genetic conditions per se. So the next question we have are, what are the risks of NIPT? Um, so I'll, I can I can try to tackle that one. I think you know one of one of the benefits of NIPT is that there's not an immediate risk to the pregnancy. So it's a blood draw, unlike uh, amniocentesis or CVS, which are a little bit more invasive and do carry a small risk for complications. I think, you know, from the perspective of risk, it might be more, you know, what does that information mean to the person who gets it? And how is that information interpreted? So, you know, I think what's important about NIPT is to remember that it isn't a diagnostic test. And so it's not something you should make any decisions based off of when it comes to your pregnancy. It can kind of guide management, but ultimately a diagnostic test is what's needed to confirm those types of results. I think another way you can think about risk is sometimes getting information that you weren't expecting from an NIPT result. Um, you know, there certainly are cases where there's discrepancy in predicted fetal sex based off of these test results, where you get a blood test result that indicates, for example, the baby's supposed to be one sex and then the ultrasound doesn't agree with that. And so that can be still potentially ben very beneficial information to try to figure out why you've got that discrepancy, but I think, you know, emotionally and psychologically, that can be very challenging information as a pregnant mother and a, you know, pregnant couple to be, to be dealing with. So sometimes I think the risks are more for the unintended information that we get from this type of testing. Bina or Dr. Adams, would you add anything to that about risks? No, I think those would sum up the risks pretty well. I mean, I think that, you know, the thing to always emphasize too when we're looking at prenatal screening and diagnostic testing is there's not really a one size fits all air answer for everyone. And so you kind of have to weigh what kind of information you want, what kind of extra information you're willing to get in any of these testing strategies um, when you're looking at them because they all kind of come with um, different pros and cons. So it's definitely something to kind of discuss with your health provider, with your general counselor when you're, you're thinking about these tests. I agree with everything that Sandra and Dr. Adams have just pointed out. Um, uh, periodically, we'll have patients who come in for genetic counseling because they've had an increased risk result on NIPT. And they tell us, well, I was just doing this testing because I wanted to know the sex of the baby. And I didn't realize that it could come back showing all of these other potential issues. So I think that's why it's so important for patients to have a really good discussion with their doctor or genetic counselor that's offering the test to figure out what is it that we might find and what other conditions are not even screenable by this testing. So the next question we got is, since SMA carriers are prevalent, what is diagnostic testing? So. Um, I think that that's a good question. SMA is one of the most common inherited genetic conditions. And you know now we have treatment options available for that as well, which makes it very important to get early diagno diagnosis. Um, so you've got really a couple of options. The most definitive is gonna be your diagnostic testing, your amniocentesis or your CVS that's available during pregnancy. So that's gonna be the type of, of test that'll give you you know, pretty much a yes or no type of answer as far as if I'm a carrier, if my partner's a carrier and we have that 25% risk, does our child have SMA or not? Um, but as Vina touched on in this presentation, for people who don't want to go the diagnostic testing route but want a little bit more information about that risk, there's at least one lab 
now that does test for SMA on a non-invasive perspective. Again, kind of what you're left with with those test results are, you know, we suspect this pregnancy is at increased or high risk for SMA versus we expect this pregnancy is at low risk for SMA. So it's not that kind of yes or no answer you get with diagnostic testing, but it can give you a little bit more information to go on from that perspective. And I would say in that, the nice thing about that is it's kind of a middle, sometimes people are, you know, very nervous about invasive procedures, um, but they want to know, do we need to take that next step? And many times these tests can help you decide whether or not, okay, we're very high risk based on this test. We want to take this invasive procedure or, you know, we're actually low risk. We can wait till postnatally and decide what kind of testing we want to do. So there's so it's, it can be useful in ways that are not maybe upfront screening, but kind of a middle ground. I think that there's, you know, it's testing's not always all or nothing. There's often a stepwise approach that you can take if that makes more sense in a, in a given situation. So the next question we got is that it's very common to hear risks related to mom's age, but what about dad? <laughs> Yeah, I think, oh goodness, yeah. So there was a, you know, I think at the end of the talk, there was a brief conversation about advanced fraternal age. Um, and I think that it's not that there aren't risks for genetic condition based on dad's age. Um, it's really that we have the best ability to test for and screen for common aneuploidies, which happen to be associated with advanced maternal age. But with that being said, when we look at all of the things that can, you know, we could find with genetic testing in a pregnancy, so, so small spelling errors that cause genetic conditions, um, birth defects, things like that, most of those things are actually not related to mom or dad's age. And so really when we look at all the things, it's kind of a global risk that's related to your family history, um, your prior pregnancies, um, and the age of both parents um, in general. So I think we, we should probably, you know, maybe emphasize more of the, the global picture, I guess, moving forward. <laughs> um, the next question we have is what's the typical amount of time that you have to wait for results with NIPT? Um, it's one of the genetic tests that has one of the probably shortest turnaround times. I'd say on average, you're looking at about seven to 10 days from the time the blood is drawn, sometimes a little bit faster than that. Um, so about a week on average is how long it takes to get those test results. Um, the next question we have is, can screening be done to determine the risk of conditions caused by hormonal changes, such as vitiligo? Yeah, I don't know of any particular screening that would tell us the the risk for that, those kinds of conditions, because they really are influenced by environment plus whatever genetic predisposition exists. And so we really don't have a way to, good way to screen for that, especially in, in the prenatal setting. So the next question we have is when NIPT is being conducted, are there condition, are the conditions screened pretty straightforward or does one in their counselor pick and choose? Um, and I think that's a really good question. I think you know, most of the labs, there's a kind of a basic, a core, a core set they're going to do. And typically that's going to be Down syndrome, um, trisomy 18 and trisomy 13. And then everything else you can kind of opt in or opt out of depending on um, your interest in additional testing, you know, how much information you want. Um, also kind of you know, you're concerned about having heightened anxiety based on a positive result that, you know, may not have as high of a positive predictive value like, like Vina was talking about. So you can opt in and opt out of figuring, of being told the predicted fetal sex. You can opt in and opt out of um, getting information about extra or missing X or Y chromosomes. You can opt in and out of those other chromosome conditions that some of the labs screen for as well. So I think that that's where the benefit of having a discussion with your provider or your genetic counselor to kind of explain what information you're interested in getting and then having a conversation about, you know, the pros and the cons, the limitations and the benefits of the different opt-in and opt-out options really are. Because that way you get a test that's more tailored to the information 
that you want. Um, the next question we have is what's the general cost for single gene NIPT if you're having to pay out of pocket? Um, and you want me to take that one, Dr. Adams? Yeah, sure. <laughs> it's a wide range, but yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. I think if you're, it, it depends on which single gene option you're looking at first and foremost. So if you're doing say that single gene panel tests, uh, you know, kind of looking at the 30 conditions um, for, for those more kind of out of the blue sporadic conditions that if you're paying self-pay, the labs that offer that, it's around $350 for that out of pocket. Um, if you're doing, say, the single gene NIPT following the carrier screening for CF, SMA, um, and uh, sickle cell disease in those, that is something that is built to insurance, but I believe the self-pay price, and Vina, you're going to have to help me with this one because we just found out about this. I think it's around $250 or so right. out of pocket. So, so that includes that first step of the carrier screening and that follow-up step of the non-invasive testing if mom comes back as a carrier for one yeah. of those conditions. And the reason it's that low is because that particular lab is focusing on billing for the carrier screening part, which is standard of care. And then if they do single gene NIPT off that blood sample, when the woman is a carrier, at least as of now, they're not really billing for that part. And then that more kind of custom is that $2,800 that um, Bina had, had mentioned earlier. So that would be for, you know, you know, potentially those conditions where if you have a child who had whole exome testing or, you know, something on a larger carrier screening panel that both you and your partner came back as a carrier for, as long as it's within the capabilities of that lab to actually set up the testing. And again, that's something that has to be determined on a case by case basis, then you're looking at just about $3,000 for that testing. That looks like all of the questions that we've gotten in the chat. Um, a final thought that I wanted to throw in is, you know, for many families that come to us for either preconception genetic counseling when they're planning a pregnancy or if they're currently pregnant and doing prenatal genetic counseling, in some situations they have, they already have a child that has some chromosome or some genetic condition I might be wondering, is this something that we can screen for non-invasively in our current pregnancy? And the first thing that the genetic counselor would want to know is for your child who has this condition, have they found the gene? Have they found the chromosome of interest? And do they know what the genetic change is? Because without that, that information, then screening for a current pregnancy is really not gonna be possible. Um, if there is a known genetic change that contributed to that child's condition, whether we can screen for it non-invasively is determined on a case-by-case -case basis. And that's where meeting with a prenatal geneticist or genetic counselor can be helpful. I think one other thing I'll add is a plug for preconception genetic counseling. You know, I think it's always, if you have the ability to have those discussions before you're pregnant to kind of put together that plan, it tends to help that decision-making once you're pregnant. And especially if you're interested in testing for something that might be a rare condition or a more complex condition, it gives us more time to really determine what is available for you so that that's ready to go and what's not available and what our other options are for screening or monitoring pregnancy for you. Oh, I'd really like to thank you all. This was a fantastic seminar and thank you, Vina, for explaining things so clearly and both Dr. Adams and Sandra, this was really, really helpful. And um, Vina, I think you have one very proud dad who wrote a comment. <laughs> and I wanted to say thank you to my audience for being kind because yeah, my parents are watching. And so, oh, that's so <laughs> wonderful. Yeah, well, you did a spectacular job. So thank you very much. And
Um, I really thank the audience for these incredible questions. This has been fantastic. Um, really, questions. really good. And um, Laura Ellis um, is also a genetic counselor and she posted our survey for tonight's webinar. So you can either click on that link and fill it out right now. It will take you a very short period of time and we'll also send it out to you by email tomorrow. Um, they, the surveys really do help us plan future webinars. So we welcome you completing the survey. Um, I just want to tell you briefly, we have two, um, well, we have a whole series of uh, webinars lined up, but the one next month will be on Tuesday, December 8th on tuberous sclerosis complex um, with Dr. Rohini Korsh. And we're really excited about that one as well. And then um, January 12th will be on Tango 2 disease. Um, that will be followed by a webinar on direct-to-consumer testing. And then in the month of February, we are planning a series on race and genetics. And so we really have been, I have a fantastic committee that's working with me and we've been working hard. So I wish you all a very happy Thanksgiving and a safe one. And thank you for joining us tonight. And thank you again, Bina, Dr. Adams and Sandra. This was wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>